How scapegoats can speak their voice after narcissistic abuse. Do you have difficulty knowing what you want for yourself? Or do relationships seem to be all about what the other person wants and needs? Do you have to curate what you say before you say it for fear of not being understood? Well, if you answered yes to any of these questions and you identify as the scapegoat to a narcissistic parent, then you may have had to muzzle your own voice in order to survive. And in today's video, I'm going to describe how and why this muzzle can be necessary for a, for a child tasked with attaching to a narcissistic parent. Then I'm going to describe how this muzzle can show up in adulthood. And third, I'll address the role of shame in keeping the muzzle affixed to the scapegoat um, survivor. And I encourage you to watch until the end because I'll, I'll discuss some resources that can help you recover your voice. Well, my name is Jay Reed and I'm a licensed psychotherapist in California and I specialize in helping people recover from narcissistic abuse. Narcissistic abuse can leave us feeling lost and estranged from our very sense of who we are in the world. And in individual therapy or through my online course on recovery from narcissistic abuse, I try to offer a map that allows those in recovery to come back to the quality of life that they know they deserve. And although each survivor must travel this path themselves, I think a map can be tremendously helpful. And I think there are three features of this map that I call the, the three pillars to recovery. The pillar number one is making sense of what happened so that you know it's not your fault. Pillar number two is gaining uh, distance from the narcissistic abuser, whether it's um, physical, emotional, or psychological distance. And pillar number three is living in defiance of the narcissist rules. And finally, you can't do this in a vacuum. I think it's essential to find and participate in communities of people who can get, validate, and support you on this path. And I want to say too that today's video falls under pillar number three, living in defiance of the narcissist rules. And you can find each of these videos categorized um, in a playlist corresponding to one of these three pillars, um, which you can find in the playlist section. And if you were a scapegoat survivor of a narcissistic parent or a partner, then I also encourage you to check out my free ebook on the topic. It's called Surviving Narcissistic Abuse as the Scapegoat, and it goes into other important aspects of what it's like to be in the shoes of the scapegoat child or partner um, to the narcissistic abuser, and you know whether it's from self-limiting beliefs about yourself that you had to adopt in order to survive, or, or why the narcissistic personality is so geared to put those closest to them down. I think the ebook can help you realize how none of this abuse was your fault, but was rather the product of the narcissist's own psychological and emotional problems. And you can find the link to the book in the description box below or by clicking here. Well, let's take a, a look at a case example from, from kind of Imagine Therapy with a fictionalized client whom I'll call Stacy. Stacy came to therapy due to pervasive anxiety. No matter what she did in her life, she always felt an underlying sense of dis-ease, self-criticism, and self-doubt. It didn't seem to matter whether others liked her or what she was doing. Her private experience within felt stormy, and unendingly so. She felt particularly ill at ease in interaction with others. When she'd come into contact with someone else, she would immediately feel exquisitely aware of what they may be thinking, feeling, and most importantly, needing from her. And she could only be someone who was providing for that person's needs. She would smile to convey that their presence was valued by her. Or she would display intense interest in what they were saying. She would be intruded upon by whatever the other person was describing. And that's how she would feel. And of course, none of these experiences by themselves would necessarily be problematic. But it was the or else quality that Stacy felt when they came about. Internally, she felt mandated to respond and essentially dote on the other person or something hard to articulate, calamitous though, would happen. It was as if her deep biological programming told her to do this and she, in her consciousness, was sort of just along for the ride. And what Stacy grew able to express in therapy was, was her deep resentment at having to lose herself in this way when she came into closer contact with others. She had profound difficulty staying seated in herself to know what she preferred, what she wanted, 
or and of course what she needed in these kinds of interactions. Just like an eclipse, the other became the moon that blocked out the light of her sort of inner self sun. Also in therapy, Stacy used her therapist's continued focus on her and his seeming ability to take care of his own emotional needs to offer a compassionate understanding for why she has, had found it so necessary in her life to muzzle her own voice and pay all, the, all of her attention to the other person. As she grew to realize she didn't need to do this with her therapist, she had sort of a different experience in the therapy where it allowed her to see how her mother demanded exactly this amount of attention from Stacy growing up. Stacy's mother was particularly volatile and prone to rage at Stacy if the mother didn't feel superior, admired, and all-powerful. And so since, sh since such states of supremacy are hard to consistently come by for pretty much any human being, this meant Stacy was the recipient of her mother's rage attacks on a near daily basis. And the only way Stacy was able to keep her hope alive that, th that she could kind of get through this was to tell herself that she might be able to predict and take care of her mother's moods and needs and thereby prevent the next rage attack. In therapy, as she grew to know and learn it was safe, she didn't need to do the same thing with her therapist, she seemed to feel safe enough to offer herself comfort and compassion for all the work and, and muzzling of herself she had to do just to keep herself safe from her mother's rages. Well, Stacy's is a story of muzzling, then uh, thankfully getting to free her own voice. Importantly, it was the conditions of danger with her mother that made it so necessary to muzzle her voice in the, in the first place. Then it was the conditions of emotional safety with her therapist that, that allowed her to begin to recover her voice. And I think for Stacy and others with a narcissistic parent, the demands from the parent are all about the parent. The child's own needs constitute a wild card that the parent structurally does not consider, nor I don't think genuinely or is able to genuinely care about. Instead, the insertion of the child's needs into the relationship with a narcissistic parent can be met with rebuke, attack, humiliation, and likely worse. So to spare the child these outcomes and preserve whatever goodwill from the narcissistic parent is possible, it can become necessary for the child to put a sort of figurative muzzle over their authentic voice. And by voice, I mean one's own unique and original actions, opinions, preferences, and needs in the world. I mean, you can think of an infant who is with their kind of good enough parent, but not a narcissistic parent. And that infant might have all kinds of movements emanating from them, you know, looking all around, um, uh, grabbing at objects or people of interest. And if the child learns that what comes from within, from within themselves, is met in a kind of benign, um, even sort of joyful way in the, in the wider world, then they procedurally learn, it's imprinted, um, that it's safe to listen to those inner signals and to act from them, that that's kind of the basis from which they get to live. But if, if others react to the child as if, if, as if the child's actions deserve rejection or attack or, or are unwanted, then the child will learn to distrust his or her inner signals, drown them out, drown those signals out, and learn to pay more attention and priority to the signals coming from without. And one emotion that's often employed to keep one's inner voice from, from intruding into the relationship with the narcissistic parent is shame. The emotion of shame results when we're expecting to be met with welcome, understanding, and appreciation, and instead are regarded as a distasteful object. The person on the receiving end of this unanticipated bad reception can feel an intense aggression towards themselves, like their very existence is what they wish they could get away from. And that's also, I think, what happens to the child with a narcissistic parent, who, where that parent regards the child's own voice, needs, and actions as something that takes away from the parent's artificial sense of dominance, uh, superiority, and entitlement. Now, the child who's hoping to be met and expecting, expecting to be met with excitement uh, and, and welcome is, is often instead met with scorn and contempt for the child showing who they really are. 
And this can lead to the child having to be preoccupied about what others think of him or her because it's the only way to manage and reduce these shameful experiences from happening. And I like to offer an example of what I mean. So let's say a seven-year-old child come home, comes home from school with a drawing that she is really proud of. It happens to be raining that day and she has a little bit of mud on her boots. As she is about to enter the house, she exclaims to her mother, Mommy, Mommy, look what I drew today. And then her mother is not, you know, instead looking at what she drew but, um, or making eye contact with the daughter and instead says, Stop, you're going to get mud all over my house. You're always so messy and don't think about how that's going to affect other people. And then let's say the mother walks away. Well, then the little girl's left feeling like she doesn't want to be who she is after being met in this way. Um, because instead of like what she hopes will be met, they're like, oh, what an amazing drawing. What do you think of it, my, my daughter, for example? Um, allowing the daughter to kind of regale the mother and just what it, this situation means to her. She's sort of met as um, the bridge is broken. And now the child's being met as so, like this sort of dirty creature who's going to ruin everything. And if such examples abound in a relationship to her mother, then, then the daughter will go from knowing and paying attention to what makes her happy and excited and wanting to share it with others to the daughter seeing herself through her mother's eyes so that her mother will not find her to be so objectionable. And the daughter will then learn to treat herself as an object just as the mother treated, treated her in this way. In doing this, the daughter will have to sacrifice um, her inner connection to herself. Well, what can you do today to restore your connection to yourself? I think the most important step towards restoring your connection to yourself is to find and maintain relationships with new safe others. Uh, by that, I mean people with whom you don't have to worry about a shaming reaction to you when you're sharing with them who you are uh, from the inside out. And I recognize that this is often easier said than done because when you have grown up with a narcissistic parent, then you may hold beliefs that lead you towards people who treat you similarly. So two resources may help with this. The first is finding a good enough therapist to help you make sense of how these kinds of voice muzzling experiences impacted you. And a second resource um, I think that can help is module four in my online course on recovery from narcissistic abuse. Because in this module, I lay out an actionable plan to identify people in your life who can offer you safety in, in relationships versus those who don't or cannot offer such safety. And I encourage you to check out the course uh, if you haven't already, which you can find in the description box below or by clicking here. Well, I hope you found today's video uh, useful. And um, again, want to thank you all for your continued engagement um, it, with the channel through your thoughtful uh, uh, comments and additions and modifications to these videos um, in terms of what you've known to be true in your experience. And I look forward to posting again next Friday, uh, 9 a.m. Pacific time. Take care.